And it was no one's assumption that this was geography classroom work at work. This had something to do with global warming and with lifestyles, work styles and manufacturing styles. But did climate change, did the millennial climate, did the millennial crisis of climates facing us from global warming, from the erraticization of weather patterns, threatening life and livelihoods, get the priority they deserved in the first millennial declaration? They got reference, they got mention, they got allusion, they got attention, but priority? They left environmental concerns to environmentalists and made climate change mitigation and also ran. By the time the world's leaders met a second time in 2005, global warming had become a much more visible and tangible experience. Temperatures had climbed, Katrina had ripped through America, and though at the summit the world's leaders commiserated with the United States about Katrina, warning the world about global warming was essentially left by the millennial leaders to one who was now not a government leader, that is to Al Gore, and to a plenary of heads of government, but a panel, distinguished no doubt, but still a panel. Development was once again a stentorian goal, development. But environmental protection and conservation were quite simply to use bureaucraties empaneled for a future date with destiny. Climate change remained an environmentalist concern. This was about the first crisis mentioned now by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. How can climate change not cause a crisis today? What about the second one mentioned by him, namely food? By the time the world's leaders met the second time in 2005, the world was unmistakably aware of the unevenness in the world's access to food, both physically and in terms of affordability. It was also unmistakably aware of the tensions growing from this unevenness, which were turning violent. World Watch said in its 2005 report about food security, despite technological advancements, the number of hungry people in the developing countries increased by 18 million in the second half of the 1990s to some 800 million today. That today is 2005. In India, the 2004 Ministry of Home Affairs report Nothing less than that, a Ministry of Home Affairs report put active noxialism in terms of 9,300 hardcore underground cadres holding 6,500 regular weapons beside a large number of unlicensed country-made small arms. And according to an FAO report for the same year, 2004, one year before the second summit, violence in Greater Darfur, Sudan, forced 1.2 million people from their homes and fields. That was, as I said, one year before the second summit. But did that second summit factor all that in with the urgency demanded of a first-class crisis? Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's statement itself gives us the answer. To fast forward back now again to the future on the eve of the third summit. With huge chunks of Greenland having hived off that continental formation, the Antarctica having thawed, permafrost seeming no longer perma and no longer frost, Himalayan glaciers having turned mangy, encouraging the administration to lift ice from the plains and build it into something that can approximate the great religious monument. Floods convulsing China and Pakistan, landslips of monumental scale decimating Ladakh, forest fires raging in Australia and Russia. Will the third millennial summit do no more than follow the second and the first? Will it continue to treat climate change as a meteorological WTO, the trade being in oxygen debits and carbon credits? If it does, MDGs will not only continue to ring no bell in people's minds, they will condemn themselves to a blocky. And let me say here that I am not yet another time surplus clamberer on on the climate change bandwagon. I am hugely worried about it like everyone in this hall is, but not in geographical terms alone. I am looking at it 
from the point of view of resource hunger, both of the greed variety and the need variety. Who are MDGs ultimately for? Are they not for our planet and its inhabitants? Often wise, more often not, in the manner they have become short-termists, using, misusing and abusing the planet's finite resources? Or are they for the end-of-term report cards of governments and leaders of governments? Climate, food and economic crises, the three culprits identified by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, are triplets born of the same parentage, the blind and blinding avarice of the resource-rich. The global economic meltdown, in President Obama's words, was caused by greed, plain greed. Global warming, it is obvious, is resulting from bulk users of that which burns, both by burning and causing to burn without compunction. Please do not get me wrong. I am not a Buddhist evangelist. But read, please, all of you, if you are into millennium things, the Buddha's fire sermon. It says everything that can be said about the climate crisis, the food crisis, and the economic crisis, behind all of which lies the failure to prefix our intentions, our actions, and our verbs with simple nouns that begin with the simple adjective, right. The Millennium Declaration was crafted for heads of government, not for heads of monasteries. It could not have pontificated on human avarice. It could not have delivered a sermon, either of the Mount Sinai kind or of the Saranath variety. But it need not have and should not have become what it has become, and which is, to use a famous phrase, a post-dated check on a crashing bank. What is the bank that is crashing? It is the bank of the resources that make for life in the world. It is the bank of the sources of life in our world. It is the bank of life as it is lived. It is life. As different from the sources and the resources that go into the banks of the world, and different from the sources of the world's assured immobilization. Read the fire sermon, I said. But to those who would prefer more contemporary stuff, let me point to two works that can take their place beside that sermon in sad frankness. I refer to astronomer Martin Rees's The Final Century, a remarkable book, a millennial book, and Chris Patton's What Next? And read too, even newer than these books, newer than yesterday's papers, someone else too, who has through the fire example described the situation in the latest issue of foreign policy. A paper by Miklian and Kani, joint authors, in the latest issue of their journal tells us what the world knows well. Titled Fire in the Hole, it cites nothing other than this year's Millennial Development Report, which says that today, India's GDP is more than five times what it was in 1991, but the percentage of hungry people in India has not budged in 20 years. It talks of how India's very economic rise, because of unevenness, has generated and turned in an obscure communist revolt into a raging resource war. An obscure communist revolt into a raging resource war. These writings show how we are gripped by three globalisms that threaten life as we know it. They could well be called our millennial globalisms. They are global terror, global meltdown, and global warming. And all three are curiously interrelated. Not causally, perhaps, but in the synchronous erosion of life's aquifers that they are, all three of them carrying out. All three are altering beyond recognition the premises and the assumptions of civilized society. The steps to be taken by countries jointly to combat terror are proving elusive and expensive. And as to economic slide downs of the kind we experienced two years ago, their ferocious return is an ever-present prospect for the patterns of investment and consumption in the world remain unaltered. Habits die hard. Those of lifestyle die the hardest. If developing countries employ modern technology, and investment devices to reach that level of confusion which is confounded by consumption with progress working together, the unevenness of the results could rip their fabric apart. I would like to suggest that with the experience of two decades of self-admitted failures behind us, 
we should own that more of the same will not work any longer. We need something different. This is not an under new management sign for the MDGs. Nor is this Ambassador Bolton's suicidal prescription for renaming MDGs. This is about redefining the goals and doing so off after what may be called taking pause for a right understanding. No one holds a patent to right understanding. Everyone has right understanding. The question is how to operationalize it. Do the Millennium Development Goals presuppose development to be the goal? Are the eight goals towards development or are they development's paths to another bigger goal? If we confound development with the goals of development, we are indeed stuck. If development with a government technology enterprise compact is the goal, we will have more and more of the following described by Ramaswamy Ayer, the distinguished formal civil servant and author. And Ayer says, consider the following illustrative instances of modern technology. Deep power-driven bore wells and tube wells sucking aquifers dry. Mammoth dams that kill rivers that may not be true of all dams, but it is certainly true of some. 